Thanks for tuning in to the Medevac podcast powered by the Robert Irvine Foundation, whose mission is to support and strengthen the physical and mental well-being of our nation's heroes and their families. They provide them with life-changing opportunities, resources, and support through food, wellness, community, and financial support programs. I'm on your host, David Reed. And I'm your other host, Christian Myers. Thank you very much for joining us on the Medevac podcast today. If you're new here, please keep in mind there's a price for the show. You have to share it with a friend or family member if you get something out of today's episode. So make sure you hit that share button, interact with the video somehow. It, uh, it helps get those numbers up. Our guest today is Ben Minden. Ben is a former Army Ranger officer type. He retired as a captain, spent about six years in the Army in uh, a few different areas. And now he is the founder and CEO of Bear Hug Cattle Co., which is a fairly unique nonprofit. And... Uh, we're really excited to hear more about it today. So this welcome. is the real life Yellowstone right here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I had to mention it. <laughs> you to. If you guys like Yellowstone, you'll love this episode. Check it out. What's his name? Dutton? Dutton? Yeah. 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 John Dutton. Here John, we go. Johnny D. Our own Johnny, Johnny D. Yeah. Johnny D. Yeah. You're, you're on that personal note with him. Yeah, we're pretty, we're pretty close. We're tight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Remind That's me not awesome. to mess with you because I see what happens when you mess with that guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, thanks for flying out all the way from Montana. Of course. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah. What's uh, what's up with these uh, spy balloons? <laughs> Tough to say. <laughs> Tough to say, but Montana is probably the worst state for a foreign object to hover over with <laughs> yeah. the amount of guns per capita there. So And nothing else. Yeah, like, <laughs> like nothing to obstruct your view to the sky. Just yeah, horses so. and guns. It's yeah, true tons Wild of West. it. Yeah, it really is. Open land. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What are they spying on? Like, oh, more mountains. Yeah, a bunch of grass. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Those cows look real healthy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Balloon didn't last 10 minutes up there. Yeah. yeah. No, no the shot. Civilian population took it down today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah no shit. Well, they all own like 50 cows up there. <laughs> That's yeah. great. So are you from Montana? No. So I grew up in New Jersey. Okay. Yeah, New Jersey. Yeah. Close enough. <laughs> yeah. So like basically next door, pretty similar. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, I grew up like 15 miles west of New York City. Oh, okay. Um, in like a really, really tiny town in New Jersey, probably like 5,000 people. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I ended up getting hooked on Montana as a teenager. I bought a plane ticket out there cause I was obsessed with fly fishing. Still mm. am. Okay. But I was, uh, obsessed and unencumbered as a teenager. And so I just bought a plane ticket out there cause I read about the fly fishing in Montana in a Orvis book mm -hmm. and then like showed up there, started fly fishing. And I was like, yeah, I'm never leaving. Yeah. I, I heard, uh, fly fishing. I've never been, I've wanted to go, but I heard it's pretty tricky. Yeah. I, I like to say it's the perfect amount of mental stimulation, right? It's just enough that like you're fully engaged, but it's not mm. exhausting, Yeah, but it's just enough where you can't really be worried about anything else. Interesting. Um, and, and it's like, it, in some ways, it, it's definitely trickier than like normal fishing. There's a million variables to figure out. And if you do mm. one of them wrong, like you just won't be successful. So it's like a puzzle that you have to solve like very consistently. Mm. So it's, it's a really nice kind of thing to get into. It's kind of funny watching people at the park like practice fly fishing. Oh, yeah. You know, I've been just, there. Oh, have you seen that? <laughs> no. <I'm, laughs> there's just people whipping around. Yeah, just stuff. standing in the grass. Yeah. Yeah. I, no, I've not seen this yeah. at all. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it looks very uh, wacky. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Like practicing Tai Chi off in the corner. <laughs> yeah. You know, hey, to each their own, yeah, Christian. I, yeah, no. <laughs> I am not shaming. I know. Yeah. I know. Um, so you, you joined the military in New Jersey. Correct. Yeah. And then... So what prompted you to join the military? Yeah. So I mentioned I grew up 15 miles west of Manhattan. Yeah. And so when I was in third grade, um, sitting in school and, uh, you know, September 11th, really crazy being 15 miles away from Manhattan. Cause like where I grew up, like everyone's parents like worked in the city. Mm -hmm. And so sitting there in third grade, my mom just came you know, people's parents were just storming the school, pulling yeah. their kids out and all this stuff. My mom come in screaming and crying and, uh, you know, y yanked everyone out of school. And like at that time, you know, the morning of nine 11 in New Jersey, like people thought like the world was ending. Oh, mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. It was nuts. And so, uh, got pulled home. Like everyone was basically just sitting in front of their TVs watching what was happening. My, my dad's a carpenter. He was like trying to get into the city to go, help do all that stuff they'd shut all the tunnels and bridges down it was mm. it was nuts and so i remember that like afternoon the hill on top of my town you could see the manhattan skyline from and like just like seeing like all the smoke and it was it was nuts wow um so that was like a really 
crazy like experience for like a 10 year old to have. Yeah. And oh, you're yeah. in third grade. Yeah. That is. And that was seared into your mind. Yeah. 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 So crazy. that was, that was crazy. And then, <laughs> you know, it kind of like that didn't immediately translate to me to like, I want to join the military. Hmm. Um, but kind of as I got older, I just, it would just like, I don't even know. There wasn't like a specific, like I didn't see like a commercial for the Marines or something and say that I just kind of like, I don't know. It just always be like, it just slowly became a thing that I was like, yeah, I'm doing this for sure. Hmm. And so, um, you know, when I was probably 15 or 16, I told my parents, I was like, yeah, I'm joining the Marines like the day I can. And they were like, I'm sorry, what? Uh, <laughs> they were like, absolutely. No, you're not. Um, like you are going to college. Like this is non, non-negotiable. Um, and so I was like, yeah, negative. Like I'm, I'm <laughs> like going to go join the Marines. It's interesting when parents say it's non-negotiable. Yeah. You're about to be 18 years and old. And like, again, like <laughs> we do do about it. <laughs> I, I didn't even know at the time. I was like, dang it. I guess I'm not doing it. Like my parents said, no, I was like, did, oh, yeah. I was like 15. I was like, didn't even cross my mind that I could just like defy them. Yeah. And so my mom was like, okay, I know there's a way that you could like go to college and like still end up in the military. Um, and so she like, was like, I heard of these places, like the Naval Academy. And like, there's this place, like a couple hours North of us, like West point where you could like join the army and all this kind of stuff. And so she mm-hmm. like toted me up there. Um, and like tap someone on the shoulder was like, Hey, can you tell my kid about like what you do at this school? And so I had like some cadet at West point, like basically like talk to me for an hour and tell me about like West point. And I was like, yeah, I'm going here for sure. And again, right. Like I'm 15, 16. I don't know that there's like a difference between officer enlisted, yeah. like army yeah. and Navy. I think I'm just like, this kid's hyping me up. So yeah. this sounds uh, great. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, this is awesome. This kid told me about a helicopter you flew in. Um, <laughs> yeah. so, that's, that's the easy way to sign yeah, right there. Like, like, Helicopters. I mean, yeah. yeah, yeah. And <laughs> I mean, so like, that was just like it from then on. And then, so I applied and got in and ended up going to doing the West Point deal, which was interesting. Yeah, just casually, right? <laughs> yeah. Just casually doing the West Point deal. So you pretty much were fell in love with West Point at 15 and you worked towards getting there. Yes. The entire time. Yeah. And again, like I wasn't even, I was like, I had such blinders on. I was like, I don't care about anything i was like the only thing i want to do is like go be in the army and if like this is the the way i need to go do it like that that's what i'm gonna do yeah Mm -hmm. um and so like again truly i really did not know that much i had never other than like that one day i had visited school like i'd never met someone in the military it's not like big where i grew up like people Mm -hmm. don't just like it's not like people are joining left and right so like i just basically knew nothing didn't know there was a difference between officers and ncos didn't know there was like different jobs you could do all this kind of stuff. I was just like, I'm going to join the army and like, that's what, it. What was your perception at the time then? What was the army to you? Just a, like a big adventure and like this big, <laughs> like noble cause and See all this world, stuff. Yeah. Said. Yeah. And I was just like, Oh man, it's going to be slick. I'm going to be sliding out of helicopters yeah. and jumping out of planes, shooting guns and all that stuff. Yeah, everybody's and, infantry. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That was literally like that. I was like Bowie knife in your mouth. Yeah. yeah. It's just like a big Vietnam movie the whole time. Yeah. Little did I know. It is. I, you know what? It is. Yeah. I thought the same thing um, until I stepped on the explosive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It took you that long to realize it? Yeah, it was all an adventure. It took me like day six, and I'm like, God, this place sucks. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this is not as much fun as I thought it would be. Yeah. I think they do. The military, and we say this all the time, has a, the greatest way of sucking the fun out yeah. of everything. Everything. Fun. Yeah. You want to go blow shit up? You want to jump on an airplane? Yeah. Oh, cool. How does eight hours in a parachute beforehand sound? <laughs> yeah. Eight hours. Also, sitting, like, let's crank the heat to a hundred. Yeah. Sardine can. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> sitting on the tarmac. Yeah. 100 degree weather yeah yeah and then uh, let's strap this 200 pound ruck in between your legs 100 yeah. percent like a sack of shit yeah on the floor. <laughs> i'll never forget the like day i, I saw when i was in 375 like the day i was like i'm going to become a jump master i we were doing a water jump down at fort benning hmm. and we were sitting outside it was like august in georgia we were sitting outside in like pts like rigged up and all the jump masters were like obviously not rigged up they're swimming in the lake they're like <laughs> grilling and then like the helicopters start coming in they like you know throw their stuff on like kind of 
half JMPI each other, like get on the bird and jump and like yeah. are back to grilling in 20 minutes. And like, <laughs> I was like red, like a lobster. I'd been like sitting in the summer five hours. Like I'm doing what they're doing yeah. Like, yeah. for sure. It's the, like, the misery duty. of, of the existence of like being just a, like a jumper is just like not something I was willing to tolerate. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's, there's, <laughs> it's, it's craziness how they do. And especially as you're lower ranked, like you just get more of the shaft. Oh mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, for sure it was a brutal that is a brutal part of the experience yeah. yeah and it's all just accountability right they don't want just a bunch of random people running around yeah also true yes yeah yeah so so what did that look like for you so you did 40 years at west point yeah so uh did the west point thing like i was you know drinking the kool-aid all that stuff like i just, i like actually really liked it like it was for me like as a you know, 18 year old male. Like, I don't think there was anything else that I would have been suited to do. Like, I loved it. I love like doing the rocking and the tactic stuff and all that. That was super fun. Um, and then, you know, I knew like, as soon as I knew enough to know there was like different jobs and stuff, I was like, I'm going to be an infantry officer for sure. Mm-hmm. Like everything else is a sham. Like I want to <laughs> yeah. go be an infantry officer. Um, so I did that and then ended up commissioning, um, in May of 2015 as an infantry officer. Mm-hmm. And that, year they were doing a pilot program where they wanted to take 25 infantry officers who commissioned and send them to ranger school before like i bullock and airborne school and all that stuff and they i think they were like trying to basically test does i bullock help you prepare to graduate ranger school or like if we just took guys who have no training and then just like send them to ranger school like what would they do we actually ended up like that group of 25 i think like 18 of us like like pass on that first go without like having gone to iBook. So I was like, yeah, I'll volunteer to do that for sure. Mm -hmm. And so I like graduated school two weeks later, went down to Benning and like started Ranger school. Um, And then like I, so I graduated Ranger school that summer, then did airborne, then went straight into iBook. So I did the whole thing backwards from Mm. how it it should be. Yeah. 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 But it made iBook really nice because like everyone there's stressed about, like going to ranger school and I was like, I'm good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. Check out my patch. <laughs> yeah. I think I was like stressing out of my pants for about a year for ranger school. Cause mm. you know, when you go enlisted, you have to kind of prove yourself in ranger battalion before you yep. get that opportunity as you know. Yeah. And you just hear horror stories from people like mountain phase for yep. instance was everybody hates. I loved it. I thought it was beautiful. Oh, it was mm. awesome. I love that place. And I was there like, kind of at the tail end of summer in mountain. So it was like really nice. And I was like, this pretty yeah. like, it's not cool walking up all those hills and stuff, but like, it's pretty. <laughs> uh, yeah. They're, like people are just using the 240 as a crutch to get up the mountain. Literally. Like, Stop using it as a cane. Yeah. Dragging themselves <laughs> and up And then the like hill. Florida was my favorite too. When people would just disappear into the swamps, you know, you'd yeah. be walking and then yep. go right through the branches. <laughs> They're and you're just like, dude, saws I love you, but I don't, I'm too tired to I help you right help. now. Like, I can't help you. I hope you're okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sucks yeah. to be you, nerd. Yeah. That must be awful. I can't. <laughs> it was, it was bad. And you get to a point too, like, you know, I, I always talk about like the worries that we have, like in a non-wartime situation and a peacetime yeah. situation. It's, it, everything's just really easy to notice. Oh, there's a snake there. Or there's a, yeah. there's a spider. In ranger school, you don't have time to think about that stuff. So you yeah, just nor living, do you like living care. With banana spiders yeah. on your face. <laughs> like there's a pygmy rattler right there. You're just like, oh, don't bite me today. Yeah, it's like that that place. Not to go into just like a ranger school rabbit hole, but yeah. like that place is like just absolutely nuts. Like yeah. uh, the things like that like people do and the things that people don't care about it's just like crazy like guys will just be like posted up with like their head against a tree just like taking a Lightning snooze strikes like, it, they get stretchered like, up yeah they're just like i don't even really care <laughs> yeah it's, it's a crazy one so you you go through your school kind of do it backwards and then you find yourself do you get to choose your battalion yeah so well you get to choose your brigade so i chose third brigade of the 101st okay. uh the rockasans cuz i knew they were slated to deploy to afghanistan hmm. like basically right when i would finish up and so i so i l- went from ranger school like graduated ranger school on friday started airborne on monday finished airborne on friday started i bulk on monday like I was about to graduate, I you know, uh, on a Friday and on like Wednesday, I got a call from 
uh, one, one, eight, seven, uh, one of the battalions in third brigade. And they were like, it was the XO. And he was like, Hey, do you have a ranger tab? I was like, yep. He was like, are you done with that book? I was like, I will be in two days. And he was like, all right, see you on Friday. Like, you know, <laughs> like we're going, like we need, yeah. like we need a platoon leader. Um, let's do this. And so I literally like threw out everything in my house, like put some, st- like my gear in my truck and like graduate <laughs> on Friday, drove to Fort Campbell, got there at, like 11 o'clock at night. My platoon sergeant, uh, Chris Magley, who's like just one of my heroes, uh, meets me at the gate of Fort Campbell at 1130 at night. Him and his wife come and like scoop me up. Um, they show me around. He's like, sweet. Like, yep, you can have off tomorrow. And then like Sunday, we're going to do like pre-deployment, like validation <laughs> exercise at JRTC. Come back from that. So yes. I had like literally that first year I was like out of school. Just I had rapid fire. no days off. Yeah. One day before yeah. deployment. Basically. <laughs> and so like get, get on a bus on Sunday, like go to JRTC, do the pre-deployment stuff. Like, uh, and then end up going overseas like as a platoon leader for the first time to Afghanistan with the 101st, which was just like such an awesome experience. Mm. Wow. And how'd that go for you? Um, it, it was really good. And again, I, I'm going to absolutely take no credit for this. Like Chris Magley, my platoon sergeant, and all, all the squad leaders were just like so switched on. Still to this day, like some of the best NCOs I've ever, ever worked with. Like I'd put Chris Magley up against anyone in the army. Like mm. he's just an absolute unit. Like he is so good at his job. <laughs> and, um, and so it was really good. And he, and it was nice because like on the officer side, um, like a lot of platoon sergeants, I think sometimes will just look at an officer and be like, ah, you're just someone who's kind of getting in the way of like us doing what, what we want to do. And, and he didn't have that like viewpoint at all. He was like, it's my job as a platoon sergeant to like, he was like, being a platoon leader is like, eh. but he was like, it's my job to like mentor you as an officer because like one day you're going to like, this is going to have an effect on the people who you're around. So he like yeah. really, really was intentional about being like, like if I was about to say something dumb, he'd be like, don't say that. Yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> it, like he had no problem shutting, <laughs> shutting the door with me and like, like just, and again, it was never like a hostile thing. He was like, dude, I'm looking out for you. And like, I want to make sure that, and like, you know, we became like super good friends and like, um, what was the age difference? So I was 23. Oh yeah. <laughs> and he was like, I mean, he had been in for like 12 years at that point. So he was probably 30, some th- young thirties at yeah. the time. Um, which again, like for a lot of people, that's weird, but like, I think military like, is different. Yeah. And like <laughs> those maturity <laughs> levels kind of even out 23 yeah. <laughs> year old officer, 30 year old enlisted. Yeah. Guy. And like, <laughs> again, like for some guys, like who showed up to the battalion same time as me, it was like weird for them and their platoon yeah. sergeant. Cause they were trying to be whatever officer. Yeah. And I was just like, dude, I don't really know anything. <laughs> um, so like, I'll just do whatever you guys want. Like I if you want me to make coffee, yeah. like, um, I bet you he appreciated that though. Cause yeah. you know, that helps is, when you have a hard headed, you know, <clears throat> lieutenant come in and think they know everything, yeah, against the guy with twelve years, yeah, yeah. and like Huge that difference. that deployment that we went on was his sixth deployment. So oh, he yeah. had like the dude was like a legitimate war hero. He had been like medically discharged from the army at one point after a deployment in Iraq. Like he got mangled, all torn up, got medically discharged, got out, played semi pro football. And then came back in, like, in, like, whatever, 2008, when the, like, war was back on. He was like, I'm not missing out on this. So, like, he was just, like, a robot for, like, this stuff. Oh, that's Um, crazy. Yeah, he was an animal. That's good to have, though. Yeah, needed it. I, I, like, say this all the time. Like, me having him as my first, like, real experience, like, in the Army was absolutely the thing that, like, set me on the path to, like, beat go to regiment and like be successful there and like all that kind of stuff. And so without a guy like him, just like telling me like the ground truth of like, this is what you need to do. This is what we need to do. This is how you need to do it. Like it was so helpful. Well, it sounds like you had the the proper mindset going into it as well. You were receptive. Like, yeah, it, you know, there's plenty of officers who show up day one. They're like, no, no, I I'm in charge because I'm in charge. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not because I know best. It's yeah, because yeah. they said I'm it's in a charge. power trip. Yeah. And, yeah. and going in with that sort of receptivity and, and being open to, you know, being guided by, even though it's an enlisted guy technically below you, like, you know, he's got six deployments in 12 years. Like this dude's been around, like I should learn from him. Yeah. That mindset's going to prepare you way, 
way better than than any other mindset if you're open to it though. yeah, yeah. yes know? yes for you sure you have to be receptive otherwise yeah. you're just going to be hard-headed and it's never going to work yep yeah. and i'm sure there's plenty of officers listening who are like nah nah i know <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah well no they're probably like i wasn't that officer yeah. that's probably <laughs> yeah I, I i've seen officers like that. oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I know those ones <laughs> yeah they're the ones who get like stuffed in hey, a closet let's, let's stop shitting on officers here no, it's, <laughs> <laughs> no just one more hang on <laughs> <laughs> no, so so that's uh that's fantastic so your deployment was pretty streamlined there yeah it was it was interesting right so like basically the first half we didn't do anything crazy we did a bunch of like um gda patrols around bath and like you know it was fun nothing that crazy uh did a bunch of like kles down into wardak and and stuff like that again like cool like you know kind of like finally getting to do the thing yeah and then that fall and winter they it was like th- this like switch flipped and it was this big counter isis push out of like jalalabad like into mm. to the east um and so basically every platoon in my battalion got paired with an oda and we just did like d- these just like big valley clearances for like two weeks at a time mm. we'd come back refit go back out with like a different oda that was like a blast oh, I'm sure Ooh, quite yeah. literally a blast <laughs> yeah. yeah so absolutely uh, that was super fun um, J-Bet, when were you in j Uh, that was probably like winter of 16 all the way through the summer of 17. Yeah. Um, yeah. and so, yeah, we probably got down there like January, February, and then ended up, you know, I, I like basically left all my stuff at Bath, lived out of a rucksack for five months and then mm-hmm. was at j going in and out of, uh, all these places for the next couple months. j okay. an interesting one. Yeah. I was in there, uh, there in 2009 and it was just a shit show. Yeah. I mean, it's still like, it's a dump for sure. Um, but I liked it cause it was like, right. Bath is like too much for me, too much stimulation, like too many people. Oh, that's a terrible, yeah. It's yeah. Too much infrastructure. Yeah. Too much. And then like j is like kind of grody. And so, um, it was nice to like be there and right. It was just like, there was not really much going on there at the time until this deal started happening. So it was like, it was just like a bunch of infantry dudes, SF guys, like a bunch of Rangers running around and like, um, it was super right. Like we had like control of the I, I gyms think, and like yeah. all that I think stuff. Every time I went for a run, I almost got hit by a predator taken off. Yeah. Yeah. The, <laughs> yeah. The place is like, and like half of JBAT is like the only protection is like a chain link fence. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's just like really sketchy. Single layer yeah, Pesco's. In, in JBAT, we yeah. had, we had a uh, two, two trucks drive around the, that perimeter. Yeah. Just with mortars. Yep. <laughs> Lobbing them in. Yeah. And the two little birds just took off and did their little run. And- yeah, it's like, and I don't remember what year it was, but there was like a big attack on JBAD that mm. one year with like, it was, uh, I think it was 375 was there. Mm. But like basically, right, like a quarter of JBAD's like a chain link fence and people were like, we're just going to just rock right through this and like, we'll be on JBAD. I, we were attacked at JBAD too. Yeah. I was in, uh, I told him I was in a shower. I had my shower. My uh, pistol was in my hygiene bag. That as, as one does, of the course. Stupid like ACA, like you know, uh, ACU hygiene bag. Yeah, yeah, and it yeah. just stuffed in there. And I run out with my towel and I just start. Yeah, it's like you're not going to hit anything. Yeah, yeah. You just like you bow, feel bow. so engaged. Yeah, yeah. You know? bow, bow. Like I'm the man. I, I'm in Call of Duty. Yeah. <laughs> When I get a yeah. towel kill. Yeah. 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 Heck yeah. Just hoping for the best. Yeah. 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 No, but it was, that was a cool experience. And that was like, probably like the first time I was like, I'm actually like getting to do the thing mm. that we want to do. And it was, again, it was like a super grody existence. Like we just go like, I think the longest stint we stayed out was like 16 days, I think. Mm. And it would be, um, you know, we're just like literally sleeping in like patrol bases and like doing the thing. And it was, it was super fun. And it was like us, my platoon and ODA and like a hundred Afghans. And we were just Mm -hmm. being like these big, like mosh pit patrol bases, like kind of all over the place. And it was, yeah, it was like super fun. And then, um, but so on that deployment, I had one night at J bad when we were back there, like someone was like, dude, the Rangers are coming in. And I was like, what does that mean? <laughs> like, right, like, again, like I'm like 23. Yeah, I turned yeah. 24, like on that deployment. Yeah. And uh, they were like, the Rangers are coming. You're like, wait till you see these guys. <laughs> and so like, right. They like flew in on the 160th birds. And then I was like, dang, like those guys look <laughs> slick. And uh, so I was like, oh, I want to, I want to do that. 
And so, like, I, you know, I'd start, I met some of their, like, uh, one of the first sergeants there and, uh, David Zeke, who's like the man. And, uh, he was like, dude, you should like go to Ranger Regiment after this. And I was like, can I? And he <laughs> was I like, yeah, yeah, this? dude, like, let's submit your packet. And so I like submitted mm-hmm. my packet, like, uh, in Afghanistan. And then I, I think I got back in August and they gave me a raft state for like the beginning of September. And I was like, Hey, like, dude, I've literally just been living out of a rucksack. I'm like a shell of a human being right now. I'm like 35 pounds down. Like I have not touched a weight or like ran for pleasure in like (laughs) five months. Like, (laughs) is there any way I could like do October for this? And they were like, we'll see you in September. And I was like, okay, Roger that. Um, So like I came back from that deployment, took like 10 days of leave and then like went to RASP after that. Um, And that was not fun. Uh, I was not prepared like mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally, like in no way was I prepared for, for like going to RASP. All it is, is just a hazing show. Yeah. It's miserable. And like, um, you know, so like uh, the RAS that like we go to RAS too, it's like you get like a lot, you get assessed a lot in like everything, like obstacle courses, PT tests, uh, team events, like math tests, like it's just crazy. So hmm. um, one of the RAS men's he always he's told me they have like ten thousand data points on you by the time you like go to the board. Wow. And so yeah, it's like a pretty pretty like intense couple uh, weeks or month and. Uh, so I went to that. and was just sucking at that whole thing. Um, and I was like, dude, there's no shot. I'm like getting picked up. Like, um, and so I went to my board and like the typical RASP board at that level is like 10, 15 minutes, right? They ask you some questions and like whatever. And uh, so I like go in and like, I'm like towards the end of the pack. Everyone else is like 10 minutes in and out. They're like, yep, got picked up. Like, Going to one seven five. Yep, got picked up. Go to three seven five. Like, and oh. you're just feeling it. And I'm yeah. just like, dude, I'm about to get massacred in yeah. here. Yeah, <laughs> just sweating. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and I was like, you know, like I'm sitting there, like, and like, right, you sit in this waiting room, and like, it's like hours of sitting there, just like watching people get pulled out. And then yeah. once some the, people are crushed, yeah, some yeah. people are like good, and like you, you're not allowed to talk. Yeah. And mm-hmm. so like guys will like walk back through and be like, yeah. And I'm like, okay, sick. Like that guy got it. Um, and so. <laughs> Um, you know, I like went to my board and 45 minutes later, they like kicked me out of the room and I'm like, what is happening right now? Like no one's ever had a 45 minute long rasp two board ever. How long is it normally? Like 10 minutes. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And so like I, ha- I was just getting grilled in there. And so my battalion commander who I was going to go work for Colonel Mike Klepper, who is like the greatest officer at like that's ever existed in the army. He, he was the, he had just taken command of third range battalion. I was going to go work for him. He was like one of the presiders of that board. Mm -hmm. So he was like, I'm going to just like, I'm going to give it to this kid. (laughs) And, uh, just messing with you then. Like I partially, but I think it was also like, he was like, you know, I'm going to give it to this kid. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. And so, um, he, I mean, he hammered me Mm. for like 45 minutes (laughs) and, uh, like he was like asking all these questions about like my last appointment. And there was like this one uh, situation where basically we had had um, uh, a, a couple of guys in our sister platoon get killed the week before mm-hmm. in an insider attack out in one of these valleys, basically like right middle of the day guy just like turns around, kills a couple of guys. We had had our, I'm making a very long, complicated story short, but we had had our platoon split like three ways. So we were like operating these little cells of like 10, 12 people. Mm -hmm. And there'd be like a couple miles between us and between OPs and stuff like that. So after, after those guys got killed, our battalion commander basically came out and was like, no more splitting the platoons because they, they had gotten killed because they were uh, split up kind of like that. And then they, you know, they kind of had trouble with the medevac process and stuff like that. And so he was like, no more splitting the platoons. You got, you got to stay Mm -hmm. co-located. And and so I was like, yep, Roger that. Um, And then the ODA we were with, we, we basically had set up this like big support by fire. The ODA was going like across the Valley and uh, ended up hitting this just like monster IED, mm-hmm. getting a near ambush, all this stuff. They got like just in- incapacitated like instantly. And so their commander called me and was like, dude, we-, we need you to come like bail us out, bring bullets, like get the wounded guys back, start medevacing people, all this stuff. Um, 
And I was like, and we only had enough trucks with us to go with like half the platoon. And it was not an insignificant like distance that we needed to go. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, dude, I'm about to get fired for like, I either like go, uh, you know, do this like medevac resupply and they, and they want us to like basically take their, um, you know, take up their spot so they could come back and refit everything with half a platoon with half the platoon that is already getting scruffed up because they're split up. <laughs> yes. And so like we were all co-located on this big support by fire and like we were also in contact like at our support by fire. So it wasn't like we were just like chilling on the hill. Like we were in contact, like they were in contact and he was like on top of that, can you split your platoon? Come like go to this area that you've never been hold this for the night. Like we're going to come back, regroup all this stuff. And like this is like a week after these guys had died, and our battalion commander was very explicit. He was like, "There will be no splitting the platoon." Yeah. Um, and so I was like, I went downstairs because I was on the roof of this building. I like got my platoon sergeant Chris Mack, and I was like, "Dude, what do you?" It's like this is this is what they're asking of us. He was like, "I was like, what do you think?" And he was like, "Dude, honestly, this was like a cool moment for me." He was like, "Dude, it's your call." He was oh, like, <laughs> "That's that <laughs> liability is released." <laughs> yep. And he was yeah. like, he was like, dude, it's your call. He's like, yeah. I'll back your play either way. He's like, but like this one's on you. Um, he's like, you're going to get fired if you do it though. It's a rock and a hard place. Yep. Yeah. And I was like, I was like, all right, we're doing it. And so I was like, let's do it. Let's get in the trucks. Like we'll leave half the guys here. We'll go do it. We'll do the medevac. And so we did, we did that. And then like, I was like, well, this has been fun boys. Like this is my last day on the job, <laughs> yeah. like all that stuff. And so I, I ended up and I, I tried to radio back to the, to the jock and like get like permission and like the battalion commander like wasn't in or whatever. I was like, so it was like, right, this is happening in like the span of two minutes. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so we ended up splitting up, doing the medevac stuff. We, we ended up pulling everyone back. So like we were regrouped by that night and I, you know, called my battalion commander that night on the radio. I was like, Hey, I just want you to hear it from me before you hear it from someone else. Like we split the platoon. I know that's like explicitly what you didn't want us to do, but like, here was the situation. He was like quiet and he was like, he was like, you made the right call, but don't ever do it again. I was like, all right, roger that. Um, and so like that was one of the decisions Good. that they, they were like really hammering me on in, sure. in the RAS board. Um, and like Mike Klepper was just like, you objectively made the wrong decision. He's like, I would have fired you if you were my platoon leader and you like disobeyed me like that. And I was like, okay, noted, got it. Like, That's fair. So like he's like, he, I mean, he's just dumping on me in this board. And uh, at the end of the board, they're like, here's some feedback for you. And they make me like, write it down, like take notes on all the things that I suck at. (laughs) And then they're like, okay, why don't you stand up and read that all back to us to make sure that like you get it. So I'm like standing in front of like the DCO of regiment, all the, all the Sergeant majors, like the battalion commanders. And like, I'm, um, it's like 10 V one. I'm standing up there being like, I suck at this. Like I'm too slow. Like all that <laughs> stuff. I'm just like reading off my right in the rain notebook that yeah. I like had. Yeah. And then like at the end of it, they're like, all right, welcome to Ranger regiment. I was like, this place. Sucks. I was like, I don't even want to do this. Like, this is terrible. <laughs> I don't want to um, do this anymore. This yeah. Place this is, is going to be every day. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, so like I, again, like went back to Campbell, grab my stuff. Like I'm still like basically living out of a rucksack at this point in my life, grab my stuff, like show back up a week later and, uh, like jump into the, to the Ranger regiment life, mm. which was just like the coolest, coolest deal ever. So, yeah. and um, how, so what was the biggest difference that you found in kind of the regular army and in battalion. Um, yeah. So like, I love like the regular army. Like I think people who like solely grow up in special operations sometimes have like a negative view of the regular army. Like the regular army is like rocks at what they do. Right. Like they're really good at like big combined arm stuff, holding a ton of ground, just like having a big presence and like the ranger regiment is just totally different. Like, right. They mm-hmm. do airfield seizures and like direct action raids. And they're very good at those two things. Um, but you're just like, your focus is much narrower. So yeah. it allows, uh, guys to, to really get good at like a very specific set of things. Whereas in the regular army, like you truthfully have to do so much mm. that you're kind of like a multi-tool. Whereas like ranger regiment, you're much more of like a scalpel type type deal. Sure. Um, and just like the culture and range regiment, uh, people just right like in the regular army, like you do get you do get guys who are like not super into it and like whatever. Yeah, you just like don't get that in range regiment. Like people just that's the biggest thing yeah. that I hear of is that you just you know you can't really trust some of the guys that are with you. Not all like there's, yeah, yeah. there's 
ninety percent of them are good. Yeah. But then there's those people that are just like, yeah, I was in trouble with the law. And- exactly. Yeah. And it's like those are like definitely exceptions <laughs> in the regular army, but ago. like they do exist. And don't get me wrong, there are a ton of guys who have been in trouble with the law and range <laughs> regiment too. They're just better at hiding it. Yeah. Um, well, that is true. Yeah. And so. I remember one time I was like, it was a couple months after I had gotten a ranger edge and I was talking to one of my team leaders and he was like, how is this different than the regular army? I was like, dude, the regular army, I deal with people getting in trouble all the time. And, and I was like, you guys don't really get in trouble. And he's like, yeah, we're just better at hiding it. And uh, I was like, yeah, I was like, don't tell me that, but yeah. Keep, they, keep it up. <laughs> they handle it in house. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. We'll and just, so we'll just all kick your ass and yeah. <laughs> send you to the and MPs. That's literally, literally it. You got a problem? They'll lock you in a room with your squad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's the, a good way to solve problems in house. It like, really is. It's and a viable most the, solution. Most of the time, when you box it out, you're yeah. all good after. Yeah. It. yeah, no. Ranger regiment is a jungle for sure. Like yeah. it is absolutely a ruthless place, and I love it. And, <laughs> and like you need I, it to be. Yeah, and I love every like everyone there, and it's like the it's the coolest place, and like. I like right when I got there, there was like a really senior platoon leader who's um, now he's he's a SF uh, team leader, Hmm. but he was like kind of like my like mentor when I got there and he was like, I'm going to just warn you. He's like, this will be the coolest thing you ever do in your life. And he's like, (laughs) you just have to accept that like you'll never be as cool as like your life like right now. Oh, yeah. And and he's like, there's going to be a moment that you like is is the coolest moment of your life like while you're here and he's like it's basically all downhill from there and he's like if you just accept that fact like you're good <laughs> but he's like don't be like thinking that this is going to be like the you know the rest of your life you're going to yeah. like be able to do this stuff and feel this way it's a hard job yes it is a hard job and it wears and tears on you yeah both it, physically and mentally yeah it's it's no joke and like Right, like it, it's so fast paced, and there's so much to do, and the expectations and standards are so high. Like going to RASP and like passing is like the bare minimum, mm-hmm. right? And like our Sergeant Major Brett Johnson, who is the 375 Sergeant Major um, at the time, who again, like just iconic, uh, looks like a cartoon character, just like absolute unit, uh, square jaw, um, <laughs> just. Like he's probably he was probably like forty five and I was like I would never fight him like he was just an animal um, and uh, he he would always say like yeah like Rasp was just like getting here like your actual assessment is like every day when you like show up to work he's mm-hmm. like and you could be gone that fast in range regiment too like if you're underperforming like you'll especially as an officer like you're just gone instantly yeah, yeah. Um, so like surviving like a stint in ranger regiment is like. It's like a good, it's like a good deal for an officer. Yeah. Stay on your toes the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. Just like, don't get fired. Um, (laughs) Don't mess up. Yeah. Yeah. That's a real thing. You're just constantly worried about that. Yeah. Mm. Um, Yeah. I watched, I watched an officer who was like on thin ice. Um, We were like, like a bunch of the junior officers were like in the S3 office or something. We were just hanging out, uh, waiting for something to start. And this, this guy had his feet up like on a desk, like kicked back in a chair and oh, no. Klepper walks in and just goes, find a new job by the end of the week. And like the dude was oh. like, what? And he was like, find a new job by the end of the week. Guy was like teaching at Iowa, like on Friday. Yeah. It was like, it was Whoa. like a gnarly place. Like I you mean. were like, I, yeah, I mean, it was nuts. I remember like, and again, not to go down like a ranger regiment like rabbit hole, but like the the like level of care in an organization like that is through the roof. Like I had I had like right gotten a haircut on Sunday and I like walked in Monday morning, like and right, Ranger Regiment's like big on like standards and all that stuff. And I got mm-hmm. like a slick haircut and um I was walking out of like the battalion meeting that morning and like Colonel Klepper just like literally I was walking past him in the hallway, like side eyed me and like grabbed me and stopped me and like pulled me in. And like, again, he's like not even looking at me. He's just like, he's still having conversations with someone else. and just like has me. And I'm just like, I'm just like, I'm in so much trouble for something right now. Holding by the collar. Yeah. And yeah. he was like, he was like, go get a haircut. And I was like, let me grab my keys. Like, I'm gonna, like, and I literally, like, I left work, got my truck, went and got another haircut. Like, I just got one like 18 hours ago. Got like another haircut. And, like, went back to work. Um, and so, like, it was just like, what was it? What was that for? Uh, who knows? He was probably just you like said it was super slick. Yeah, it was like a legit ranger haircut, and he was like, "Go get another haircut." And I was like, "Whatever, Hi, whatever you say, and boss." Tighter. Like, yeah, higher and tighter. Like, like, please don't fire me. Like, I love it here. Um, so. 
Yeah, I mean, it I guess was, it's uh, not one of those moments you could be like, I just did. Sir. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> negative. Yeah, so I was like, <laughs> I just got one yesterday. And I, like, sure. I did that this calculation is... in my head. I was like, say something or just like shut up and get your keys and yeah. go get another haircut. I was like, easier path of least resistance is like, go pay 10 bucks and get another haircut right now. Yeah, yeah um, easy enough. Yeah, but you like, say, you say level of care though, and a lot of people are like, this is hostile work environment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah. like, that's oh, like, <laughs> that's idiots. an extreme example, but yeah. like, level of care. That's hostility a, that's like, a good day yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> to get um, two haircuts in a row <laughs> and like one of the coolest one of the coolest like right when i tell people like the level of care is just like so high i remember like right when i like basically went down to bco as a platoon leader there was a squad leader there and like ranger regiment has like right pretty good uniform standards mm. um when you're like in garrison yeah and uh like my Boots were like the blue book, which is like the Ranger standards book says like your boots have to be bloused between like the second and third eyelets on your boots. And mine were like drooping down slightly past my third eyelet. <laughs> You're fired. <laughs> and like literally a squad leader, like an E6, like uh, just walks up to me in the, the office and is like, hey, your boots are your boots are bloused too low. And I was like, sweet, thanks. And uh, he was like, yeah, don't come to a place that gives a fuck and not give a fuck. And I was like, Whew. I was like, dude, got it. Like noted like set the tone like i get like i get it right like everyone here cares like i need to care that much mm. and so like but that's like an everyday thing like again like just a difference between that and the regular army like that would have never happened in the regular mm. army yeah. and like i literally just walk in it's like my first day in bco and like uh you know an e6 squad leader walks up to me he's like fix yourself like you're <laughs> embarrassing like my ranger <laughs> regiment and i was like dude no like i want the feedback like yeah. dude if i'm doing something wrong like i want to be on like the level that you guys are on the icing on the cake yeah. on that last one yeah, like, yeah try yeah. to like, give more of a fuck yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> like don't don't come to a place that gives a fuck and not give a fuck like i'll never forget that i was just like um Thank you. Yeah, you look like yeah. a shit bag right it's, now. Yeah. Like, Why? I mean, the fucking <laughs> squad leaders are the punchers, dude. Oh, like, my God. You, you just got to let them do their thing. I love ranger squad leaders <laughs> oh like i God. love yeah. ranger squad leaders yes oh, it's fucking rough because like you're just like you know they're the guys that you're gonna send in to do the shit everything they're yeah. like literally yeah. the bread and butter of ranger regiment the whole yes. organization exists around like squad leaders it's yeah. such a cool it dynamic there. best position yeah it in, is it I is here you know i've never gone above that but <laughs> yeah yeah well like most guys don't want to yeah there. yeah <laughs> Um, but yeah, so like, it was a super cool place to like grow up in the army and yeah. I just like loved it. And, uh, like the stories and the experience and like the, the guys from three B three, seven, five were just like, I mean, like I'm still super close with all those guys and, sure. um, yeah, it's such a cool place to be. Yeah. yeah. So, so that was, that was pretty streamlined then. Yeah. Easy day. Easy day. Right. Yeah, Obviously no, no hiccups in that one. No hiccups, just smooth sailing yeah. range regiment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And like, I also want to caveat this with like the quality of like junior officers at the time. And like B co three, seven, five was like disgusting. I'm not including myself in that. I'm saying like my boys who are the other officers, like Kevin Giro, Nick Satwitz, Ian Con Cannon, Winston Bolt were like legitimately like gods. Like they were PT studs. They were squared away all the time, like tactical geniuses, like could solve any problem. And I'm just like literally just like trying to tread water and like <laughs> uh, stay alive, like in this organization. Um, Imposter and, and like, yeah. yeah, like the, the junior officers were nuts. The platoon sergeants at the time, Kyle Sikora, Dan Tagami, Luke Stapleton were just like legends. They were all so good at what they did. Mm. Um, and then like, so, like, the organization as a whole was just, like, ridiculous. Like, again, like, totally recognized. I'll never be around, like, such a cool group of people, like, ever again in my life. But it was awesome, for yeah. sure. You can uh, stay around them, though, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, like, do. I can hang out and drink beer with them still. But Yeah, uh, but it's, like, just living vicariously through the past experiences. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. That happens. So, uh, what was next after this? So, after that, uh, basically, I went to the, you know, captain's career course. And... uh and then, you know, this is another long convoluted story, but like basically at the captain's career course. So after you leave range regiment as an officer, you have to go do like a stint back in the regular army for like a year. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I, I can't do it. Like, I just like, I don't want to go back and yeah. like trade in my cries for like whatever the like regular <laughs> army. I like the yeah. like plate carrier, whatever. Yeah. And I was like, I can't like go back. And I was like, I, I don't like, I want to get back as quick as possible to like some form of the special operations community. And so 
I, I ended up going to SFAS, getting picked up, and then PCS to brag for the Q course, and PCS mm-hmm. to brag for the Q course in spring of 2020. And that's when, like, COVID happened. Like, everything just, like, came to a screeching halt. Like, yeah. there was, like, two months where, like, we weren't even allowed to, like, go on base to work. And so I was, like, basically just floundering around doing nothing. On vacation. Yeah. <laughs> and, like, I do not do well with free time. Yeah. And so I was, like, it was, like, two, three months in. I was, like, I need I need to go, like, do something, you know, productive. Oh, and yeah. so I called HRC and I was, like, you know, what do you have that I could go do, like, right now? And there was um, like a slot to go work in the U.S. Army Africa headquarters in Italy on mm. TDY for like eight months, and I was like, "Solid." I was like, I'll, "I think I can do that." Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. And so I, I just like jumped on a plane um, and then went over there and was in Italy for like most of that year, oh, and then came nice. came back to Bragg and got out from there. Wow. So, How was your time in Italy? Did you enjoy it out there? I, I mean, it was middle of COVID. Silly. So. It was so awesome. Oh, was and it? like okay. I the COVID deal was cool because like I'm not a big like guy to go to the bars or anything. Yeah. But that where that base is in Vicenza, you're like an hour from the Dolomite Mountains. Oh, and so beautiful. like I yeah. literally I climbed and hiked and did mountain stuff. Vincenza is beautiful. I was there a couple of years yeah, ago. Yeah, it's nuts. It's and like gorgeous. I would go like run in the morning at like six o'clock yeah. around Vicenza and it's like completely deserted it's like you're running through like a time machine yeah. and there's this <laughs> like to yourself yeah there's this big hill called barico there which like goes up to this church it's like a thousand years old or something and the incline to get up there is like absolutely gnarly okay and it was like i think it was like two and a half miles to the base of the hill and then like we're a half mile of just like straight grinding up the hill but you could time it to where you'd be like on top of barico for like the sunrise over vicenza and it was like this is like one of the coolest like and things. you're by yourself, right? Yeah, yeah like I'm like, literally just cruising, no else cruising by myself. Like the town is awesome. still asleep. Yeah. Um. And so like Italy was just cool. Just like not much in the way of like armying for me, but like sure. it was like a super cool experience. To, like go hike and climb and you know poke around Italy yeah, and yeah. go to Venice and all that kind of stuff. So that was super cool. Yeah. Um. But then yeah, I ended up getting out. Um. After that. Okay. Yeah. That's With fantastic. any plans, you, uh, you just so, so decided, I decided you were done. Yeah, um, I had a right when I got to Italy, I ended up applying to like Harvard <laughs> Business School as like a. I had a buddy from three seven five who who had um, gone there, mm. and I was like, dude, I'm thinking about getting out. Like, what do you think I should do? And he was like, dude, like business school is like kind of cool, and so um, I was like, I'll throw my like hat in the ring for that. And so I, I at the by the time I left Italy, I'd been accepted there. For like the following year. Oh wow! So I had uh, like you know that as kind of my like backstop of like what I was going to do afterwards. And uh, Harvard was your backstop. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was like, okay, like I don't know like what I'm going to do, but like I'll get out and basically um, you know do other stuff until okay. then. Yeah. And so you ended up going to Harvard Business School. Yes. So I got out, and basically at this time, like the nonprofit um, was kind of like. It was developed and kind of going at like a really, really like small scale. Okay. And so I was like, I'm going to take the time in between getting out and, and, and starting school to like really like pour into this. Mm -hmm. And that's when it like really started to like kind of turn into what it is today. So I was, um, out in Montana. Um, I had, when I was in the army, I'd bought like a little chunk of land in the middle of nowhere, Montana, like Mm -hmm. truly the middle of nowhere. (laughs) And, uh, my dad being a carpenter i drug him out there for the summer we built a built the the house that i now live in and uh so i was doing that and then setting up a a kind of the like revamped version of the nonprofit. and then i was just cowboying in colorado wyoming montana and then uh like literally left that and uh went to like business school and and then um yeah nonprofit like continued doing the nonprofit stuff the whole time at business school and everything Wow. Okay, so you were kind of like learning through school how to run this nonprofit. Yeah, which mm-hmm. that quickly became like my rationale for business school. Like when I applied, I was like, this is like, I don't know what I'm going to do. This is this is something that would be like nice. Yeah. And then after that, um, you know, time I had spent in Montana and Wyoming, Colorado, like with the nonprofit, like things started to get like serious for the nonprofit. Like we were getting money and we we're like building relationships and mm-hmm. like we were getting a bunch of interest from the vet side. And so I was like, it's time for like me to take this a little bit more seriously. And my thought process was if I'm going to be good, 
a good steward of like donors money. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. There's no difference between a nonprofit and like a business other than the profits like need to remain in the company. Yeah. And so my thought process was like, I want to go like learn from the, at the best place to like be good stewards of this so that I don't mess this up. Mm. Um, yeah. and that's like kind of how, how I focused my time at business school was all around, uh, like turning the nonprofit into like a more serious, sustainable, um, deal so mm-hmm. that we could we could get more so, people so through. tell us about it tell us about what you do yeah. yes bear hug cattle co yeah so yeah. bear hug cattle company right it's a non-profit and kind of the the one-liner is like we want to give vets who are transitioning out of the military the like skills resources and connections to get their first job in the ranching industry okay um and then right how we do it we have a 10 week long intensive program where um guys will show up and we teach them everything they need to know about the business side of it, riding horses, take mm-hmm. care of cattle, um, doing that. And we do that for the first two weeks. And then the back eight weeks of it, we go to seven of these like really big famous ranches across Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, and just like do on the job training, wow. uh, which is super fun. And we're just like living in canvas wall tents, like out in the mountains, like with a pile of horses and taking care of cattle. It sounds so amazing. Yeah. It's awesome. It's awesome. And, uh, it's so fun with, you know, uh, to just, it's like, it's like basically like you're back in ranger school and like, you're literally just like waking up at ungodly hours and it's cold. Like last year we were out, um, at little belt cattle company, which is a, uh, um, a deal that's owned by a Navy seal, Greg Putnam, who started this like awesome cattle company, Mm. um, in Martinsdale, Montana, and they're just crushing it. And, and we were out there. It was like June 19th. And we woke up in these canvas wall tents. We're like 20 miles away from headquarters, like out in this big middle of nowhere thing with all our horses, like take care of the set of cattle. And uh, it was snowing on June 19th. <laughs> and it was like, dude, this is miserable. Oh, yeah. Like so miserable. It's like you get up at like 4 a.m. Right? Yeah. And just like and every like, day. And like that's like, right. Week. That's yeah. like part of our like thesis basically is like, guys get out and they go work at Walmart and they hate their lives and end up getting in a bunch of trouble because they don't have like a team. They don't have like a reason to get out of bed Mm -hmm. in the morning. They're not like doing something that they care about. Yeah. And with this line of work, it's like, it's hard. It's like kind of dangerous. Uh, you do everything in a team Mm. and like, there's just like a reason, like you have, like you have to get up, like, right. You have have to be in the moment. Yeah. You have to be like, and it's, it's one of those deals too, where, like you can't just like be like, Oh, it's five o'clock. Uh, I guess like this isn't important enough for me to keep working on it. It's like, well, we'd like qu- quite simply just have to do this. Yeah. So like until it's done until it's done. Yeah. Um, and that, that means like 10 o'clock and our next day starts at 2 AM. Like that's what we're doing. Mm. And so it's like kind of hardcore, uh, in Absolutely. that, in that respect. Yeah. And so I, that's something that I think, um, that's just like really latch on to. Mm. And I was yeah. joking with my buddy last night. Um, I was like, if you give a vet, the opportunity to like have a headlamp and do something like at night, like they just like revert back and a oh, yeah. switch gets flipped. Yeah. And if I was like, I was telling him like one night we had to shoe horses and we didn't finish work until like eight o'clock at night. And so mm. we got back at like nine and our next day started at two thirty Cause it was like middle of summer is getting really hot. And so we had a day go really long and our next day was starting really early. And so it was like nine o'clock and we started shooting horses like with headlamps and like headlights of trucks. And like, you would have just like big smiles on the guy's faces. You would have thought like it was Christmas morning. Like you give a guy a chance to put a headlamp on, like do something hard. And they're like, I love this. Yeah. Yeah. A headlamp and gloves. And they're like, yes, they're they're right back. They're like, it feels like home. I know where I'm at. Yeah. 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 (laughs) It's so interesting. And I I bet you it feels just even more alive. Like you're doing even, even though it's nothing extravagant or, you know, trading on the stock market. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but you feel like you're doing something important. Yeah. And it, like the stuff like actually matters, right? Like there's like, um, like people are counting on you. Animals are counting on you. Like yeah, yeah. businesses are counting on you. Like it's like a pretty serious deal. Yeah. And, uh, so I think people like to have that sense of like a mission again, where mm. it's like what yeah. I'm doing actually matters, right? Like if you work at Walmart and I'm not like saying that's bad, but like if you work at Walmart and don't show up to work, like life goes on. Like yeah. if you work on a ranch and you just like, don't show up, True like story. everything is like in trouble. Mm, like animals yeah. are in trouble. Your buddies are in trouble. Like the ranch is in trouble. Yeah. So there's like this sense of like 
actual like mission and urgency that comes with this kind of work that's yeah. like super valuable. Yeah, some and, ownership. And you don't yeah. have a chance to get in your head as much too. I think that is the biggest issue yeah. that a lot of people are facing today. When you're a Walmart greeter and you're sitting at the storefront, you, uh, all you have is all day is those intrusive thoughts and like I should be doing this and like am I yes. wasting my life away? When you're doing something physically intensive like that, yeah. you have the ability to just get so focused. Like you yeah. said with fly yep. fishing, yep, is just focus on the task at hand and and laugh with your buddies. Yeah, you know? yeah, no, and it's it's like it, it's hard, right? It's a very hard skill set to learn. There's a reason that like we have a 10 week deal and like 10 weeks is like barely enough to get a guy like I'm sure surviving. Mm. Um, and so Cowboy it, camp. <laughs> yeah. It takes, it takes a lot to get a guy um, to where they can be, you know, not, they could be not value destructive. They're like value add when they show up to work at a place. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it's like it, it th- there's, and I don't want to make it sound like it's just manual labor. Like it's very like intellectually challenging too. Like there are very complicated problems you have to solve like in very short amount of times. Like, <laughs> right. If you imagine like there's a group of four or five guys on a horse and a pen with a thousand, 1000 pound animals, like you're making split second decisions, which will have like real time implications on like how your day goes um, <laughs> or how the year goes or how the yeah. season goes and all that stuff. So like there is a real sense of like, you're, you're solving very complex problems. Um, you're also doing like the physical aspect of it. So it's like a really good blend, I think mm. for, for people who are getting out, who want that sense of whether it be mental or physical, you know, stimulation again that they felt in the military. It's like a yeah. very, very good match. It's the best match I've ever seen, which is why, you know, I'm so passionate about it and we do it. Sure. Yeah. It was so interesting when we first chatted about it. Cause you just don't even think that that is so closely correlated. Yeah. 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 No, yeah. it's, it's super cool. And, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's awesome. I love it. And, and, uh, I, I think, oh, right. We have, um, hundreds of people who apply for our deal. Yeah, I was gonna. I was gonna ask that. Like, how popular is becoming a rancher post military? Because it's not something I've been exposed to most of my life. Like, it's yeah, it's very very alien to I, me. I, I think it's becoming more popular in, in the vet circle because, mm. um, right, the work is great. The places you do it is great. the The biggest thing for me is the people you do it with are. Mm. The, it's the only group of people outside of the military I've ever been like comfortable around. Yeah, their values driven like mission oriented they care so deeply like a level of care that you only get like with people in the military like the ranching community is that as well like yeah the like i could do a whole day of talking about like the times that the guys in that community have like gone so far out of their way to help me or the program or anything like that it's just like it's crazy and so you get you get surrounded by this group of people. You're in these beautiful places. You're doing work that's meaningful. And I think like that notion of all those things is starting to catch on in the like vet community and people, yeah. right? Like where it used to be, it's like, oh, I'm going to get out and go work for a hedge fund. And then like, you hate your life. Yeah. You're now, sitting there answering emails. All yeah. Time. Now, now cubicle. people are like, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. And so yes. they, they're starting to look for the other options. And one of them is us and the ranching mm. community. It's amazing. And so, um, it's been, it's been hugely popular on the vet front, which like we're resource constrained and time constrained and all that stuff. So like we could take, we've historically done, uh, four people for the summer, okay, which is again, a huge logistical nightmare. If you think about like toting around four people, all the associated gear horses, it's oh, like yeah. a lot And this year for the first time we're doing eight and next summer we'll be doing 16. Wow. That's awesome. Um, yeah. So it'll be, it's really cool. Like our number one priority is like being able to serve more, more vets. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, there's just a lot that goes into that. A lot of like logistics and planning and yeah. resources and, and, and stuff like that. But we're like, it like breaks my heart. Like when we do the applications in the fall, it breaks my heart that, uh, you know, we, and it's not like there's 500 applicants and like 400 of them are like a joke. It's like of a, of a hundred, you know, 70 of them are really good. Like mm. 30 of them are amazing. And 20 of them are like, this person needs this right now. Yeah. And it's like, well, we could pick four and yeah, it just like hard. kills me, kills yeah. me. And so like, we're super focused on trying to grow the whole deal so that we can do more and sure get but, more people but what you guys it, what you guys are doing is is i mean it's imperative and very valuable for individuals 
in a long-term sense, right? You're helping somebody change their life and establish their life post-military forever. There's yeah. a lot of nonprofits who help a lot of people, but they help them with a single day or a single event or something. Yeah, and, yeah. And this more isolated focus where you're helping one, you know, four people at a time set themselves up for the rest of their life. That's a that's a massive impact for it is a few people, but the longevity that you're you're giving them and you know, the opportunity that you're you're providing for them to enhance their entire life is huge. I yeah. Mean, that's, it's very valuable. And I'm glad to see that there's more nonprofits popping up like that who, you know, the other ones are incredibly valuable, obviously, but there was a lot of them for a while where they're just focused on helping as many people as they possibly can with a few things. Yeah. And the more isolated and more focused ones, uh, it's, it's really cool to see that. Those, those ones are the, are the toughest to raise money for it. Oh, it's gotta be. Yeah. That yeah. When you're, when you're very program specific, yeah, it, it is a niche. Yes. And it's really hard to do, you know, those, those broad mission statement nonprofits, mm. um, are, are that specific. It's, it's easier they, to fundraise for. Yeah. It's easy to fundraise for. We're helping veterans. Okay. We're helping oh, veterans. veterans. Yeah, okay. yeah. There you go. Yeah. yeah. And, and two, um, you know, this is, and we talked about this before, it's difficult <laughs> to capture something like this, to share to the world. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you're, you're out there focused on the mission at hand and, actually focusing on doing the right things with these people. There's mm -hmm. no cameras. There's no nothing yeah. like that. So it's just word of mouth yeah. at this point. Yeah. Yeah. And so it is. Yeah. I, I, there are a lot of awesome nonprofits that do like yoga retreats or like, yeah, pay a guy to come out for three days and shoot an elk yeah. and mm -hmm. like all that stuff. That's cool. I love that those exist, but our focus has always been like, I, and I would describe us as like a vocational training program. Like just like yeah. if a guy wants to go learn to be an electrician, there's a school for that. Like it's a, great a, guy, way to put it. a guy wants to be a rancher, like we're the school for that because I want to give you a way not only to like provide for your family for the rest mm -hmm. of your life, but like love the way that you do it. Yeah. Um, and so that's kind of how we've been, been focused, but it is definitely like a different niche of, of nonprofit. Sure. I, I think now is there a way to set that up to where you guys are considered like a vocational institute? That's a nonprofit that way guys can get out and utilize like their evoke rehab, uh, and like use that towards your program. Is that a possibility? Yeah. Something that's something we're looking into. We looked into the GI bill very early on. Like could a guy use his GI bill and get a housing stipend when he's with us or yeah. something like that? Yeah. Um, and the answer for that one is no, because to be GI bill eligible, a certain percentage of your students need to not be military. So they could basically mm. establish what's the population's willingness to pay for your services. So that if mm. it's only 10,000 bucks, like you can't charge the government 50,000 bucks for yeah. a guy to come to yeah. your deal. So like we can't ever do the GI bill because we're exclusively a veteran program, which to me is crazy. Um, but like I get, I get the rationale. Um, Voc rehab is something that we're looking into. And I think eventually, yes, okay. uh, there's a lot of like accreditation and certification and all that yeah. kind of stuff, of uh, complexity and like it's on, it's on the horizon, but it's just like, we're still in like a knife fight of, yeah. um, you know, trying to get guys to like li live, live through the day yeah. Um, yeah. and stuff. So yeah. Yeah. The, the logistical nightmare too, of working through that kind of stuff. Oh um, yeah. But Vogue Rehab imagine. would definitely be something to try to check out. Yeah. Um, that's an interesting one because they do do those for, um, multiple trade crafts yep. uh, type training. Did you use uh, Voc Rehab? I did all? not. Okay, I did not. Okay, yeah, but I, but I they changed they changed it recently at the time where um, you could kind of double dip. Mm. Yeah, you can do both, right? Yeah, yeah, you could do both. Yeah, so I know if you have like a month left on your GI Bill, that's all you need is one month left on your GI Bill. And I have six weeks. Uh, yeah, and you can apply for Voc Rehab for okay. any like any mm -hmm. any process. It's wow. it's good information for people yeah. who are looking to extend yeah their their educational benefits or, or other things. But yeah, no. definitely something to work on. And I think that the veteran community is making so much noise now, where you know enough's enough, right? Yeah. We need to be taken care of and. Yep. We need to do things that are more set to our skill craft. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I say this all the time. It's like, right. Our value to the ranching community too is like, we're going to provide you the best employee that you've ever had. Like mm -hmm. this person yeah. doesn't care about waking up early. They don't care about getting rained on. They don't care if it takes till 10 o'clock at night. Like this yeah. is like standard practice for like vets. Mm -hmm. And uh, like you're, we're already pre-screening, like you're going to get a guy who's okay with that. Um, and so, um, yeah, like it, I think it just works, um, mm -hmm. from, from that sense. Do you have people, um, you know, those isolated incidents where they come in and just not be able to handle it? 
They're like, this is not good for me. It's raining. It's cold. I'm done. Or do most of these guys know exactly what they're getting into? I would say none of them know what they're getting into. <laughs> <laughs> it's like really hard to know. Even if you like have seen our videos and talk to us and all that kind of stuff. And what, during the interview process we do with everyone, like I, my goal during the interview process is to get them to understand what they're applying for, yeah. because it is not uh, a fun, like 10 weeks in the oh, classic sure, yeah. sense. Like it is very hard yeah, and it is very long Rapid Like fire. in 10 weeks. Last summer we had a cumulative one and a half days off in 10 weeks. Um, so like it is heavy duty, like work um, and it's hard. Yeah. And like you're, like it's very physically demanding yeah. and the hours are crazy long and it just never stops. And so like my goal in the interview process is like make sure people get that. Um, and like really be like, yeah, we're going to go a week living in the mountains. Like you're not going to shower. Your cell phone won't work. Yeah. And like, you're going to be so caked in dust by the end of the first day that like you could like, you could hear it. Like when you like move around <laughs> and like, so for the most part, by the time we get people, they're comfortable with that. What I think is is shocking um, to use like some examples from from last year is I think people underestimate how difficult it'll be in terms of learning a skill mm. um, because you get like take the classic ranger squad leader example. You get a ranger squad leader who's just been so good at his job for so long, and then you know the first day you show up with us, like we're sticking you on a horse that weighs a thousand pounds. You and all your rangerness can't make it do what you want it to do. Like it's going to beat you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and you need to learn the way to like communicate with this animal, which has its own brain to like go do, get a job done. Mm. And right. That's it at its simplest form. And then like we add in like roping and now you're on a thousand pound animal going 30 miles an hour. You throw a rope onto a cow and then tie it to your animal they're now both are running 30 miles an hour you're tied together like there's a lot going on oh, yeah. it takes a ton of like practice and skill to get good at and i think people underestimate how hard it is to learn that skill and how much time and repetition all that stuff and i i would say we typically see around the seventh week it like people get it mm. uh but like the first two weeks are a massacre oh, <laughs> a I massacre imagine. Yeah. yeah and then like so, like, I'd actually be really curious to, like, chart this out. But, like, the first two weeks are just an absolute massacre, just downward spiral of confidence, pride, everything, just getting flushed down the toilet. And then they, they start to learn a little bit. Like, they can start to do some stuff, and then mm. they get overconfident really quickly. And then, like, you throw something at them, like, okay, we're going to go do this today. And they think they're, like, they're like, I got this now. I've been doing this for three weeks. And then they're just like, nope, I suck again. Yeah. And then, <laughs> Sounds about right. And then, like, at, like, week six or seven, they start to come up on the other side, right? You have, like, some confidence. You could start to perform some tasks without having to, like, cognitively think about it. Like, it's just becoming a little bit instinct at the time. Because mm. the first couple of weeks, like, if I asked a guy, like, when he's riding a horse, like, what's your name? He'd be like, uh, uh, like, because there's just so much going into learning like this thing and the guys are terrified and like, yeah. right. You're like doing all this crazy stuff, but by like week six or seven, you know, you could be, you could be pretty confident to okay. where you can be having a conversation with someone and doing it. Right. We do it. So the repetition in in the program is insane. Mm. Um, that like we do it all day, every day for 12 hours a day that by the time you're on week six or seven, it's just like, you know, there's and, some confidence. And that's seven straight weeks of virtually no sleep and it is just an attestment to the type of training that you need to have like skills are not easy to yeah. develop yeah uh, no it's 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 hard especially it's really hard. as you get older <laughs> yeah you yeah know, we get more and more used to mm. yeah kind of coasting throughout our day yeah yeah and mm -hmm. like the pride thing is i think the biggest barrier to entry with this like exactly. with learning new skills exactly. right like i said like you're a ranger squad leader you did it for a decade you are the best on earth at what you do there's no question about it and then like you need to humble yourself to be i don't know how to do this i'm going to be riding around next to a 16 year old kid who's been doing this since he was two he's the yeah. ranger squad leader of this world <laughs> yeah. and like you're a 28 year old like uh, you know, basically getting told to fix your boot blouse by like the 17 year old yeah, kid. Yeah. Um, and so like, <laughs> that's something that again, like we try and impress on people like really early is like, this is going to be very uncomfortable for you, yeah. but this is a great skill to learn. If you care about being successful outside of the military, because guess what? 
anything you do, whether you stick with this or not, you're going to feel this exact same way if you want to get good at it. Oh yeah. And so whether that's learning a new sport or learning a new trade or going to work on wall street and working at a hedge fund, like you're going to feel this inadequate mm-hmm. at anything. And it's like, you need to like have the resiliency and like humility to be okay with that. Like, it's not yeah. bad. Like no one's expecting you to be John Wayne, like on your second day ever doing this. And yeah. like, uh, but there's just like this crazy pride, um, thing that needs to get like overcome. Pride, yeah. 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 Man. It is a killer. Yeah. So, uh, that's a, that's a fun one to watch too, from like a backseat. And you, you do, you get that everywhere. I remember get getting into jujitsu. It's oh, the yeah. same thing. I'm like, I'm a ranger, you know? <laughs> yes. And then like some 14 year old brown belt kicks your butt. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and you're like, damn it. I have a hilarious experience with jujitsu, but like I got like <laughs> um on my uh third deployment, like I was in Iraq, um, and we were there with uh with a Delta troop, and one of the guys was just like crazy into jujitsu, and I was like, I must get into this. Yeah. <laughs> and um teach me your ways. Yeah, I was like <laughs> I was like, dude, when do you do jujitsu? He rolled at like ten o'clock at night every night or something, and he was always looking for people to beat up because, like, <laughs> right again, it's a pride thing. Like, people yeah. don't like it's hard to convince people to do something like that because, like, especially if you're a ranger or a delta guy, like, you don't want to be the new guy. And like, someone who's moderately experienced at jujitsu will always beat the new guy. Mm-hmm. Like, it doesn't matter who you are. Like, if you have six months of training, like, you're gonna beat the new guy, even if he's like better, stronger, faster, all that stuff. And so he was like having trouble finding people to roll with. And I was like, dude, I'll roll with you. I was like, I'm not too proud to like get my ass kicked like over and over. And so like every night I would go roll with him. I like, I think I literally got tapped out like 50 times in a row. Oh yeah. And like, I mean, this guy was just embarrassing me, wiping the floor with me. Spin on your back. And And like, like, it got to the point where like, he would just have me folded up on like his 14th tap out of me of the night. And I would be like, Knew I was about to get tapped out, and I was just like folded up. And I was like, "Dude, what am I supposed to do right now?" He was like, "Oh, put your arm in here." I was like, "Okay, thanks." And then I would do that, and then he would just like do something else, tap me out a different way. <laughs> yeah, just but follow through. Again. Such, such a humbling experience of like yeah. uh, just being like, "Yeah, it's like I'm not too proud to know that like this guy's better than me at this, yeah. right?" And like maybe one day if I stick with it and I'm like disciplined about it, and um, you know, put the time and effort into it, like I'll tap someone out one day, maybe. Mm. So it's a very valid point. Is that pride could be a detriment yeah yeah it's like i think it's the biggest thing that keeps people from like trying to learn new stuff and mm. and and it really is is a lot of people won't even put forth an effort because they worry about embarrassing themselves yeah yeah and yeah. that's a problem yeah it is it's one of those things too where once you do it once like once you like em- embarrass yourself or like suck at something once you're like oh like i'm still like who i am i just like now and right everyone knows you suck at the thing now you just know you suck at the thing too so it's like (laughs) it's like dude yeah it's cool like no surprise here like i don't know how to do jujitsu i'm like getting my ass beat like every night like it's cool everyone else already knows yeah everyone else already knows that like this guy could just destroy me so like it's not that big of a deal and then like once you get over that you're like oh my god like what else can i do that i you know i'm gonna suck at and maybe one day be good at (laughs) the answer is anything yeah anything most everything yeah yeah is i think the proper answer but um, especially if you treat it like the way that you're you're instructing your your students out of the 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 bhcc yeah yeah as we'll call it yeah Yeah. i mean yeah (laughs) the bhcc BHCC. well the way that you're instructing out there i mean you you run you run a program for for 10 weeks straight 12 hours a day like doesn't matter what you're doing, you're you're gonna get a lot better. But you have to want to be there. You have mm. to you have to put in the time. And oh the yeah, big time. Yeah, it's and not I, something you can dabble into. Yeah, that's yeah. something I tell the guys too. I'm like, listen, it's no secret that you're not good at this. Like, <laughs> yeah. a guy who's been doing this for 30 years is gonna watch the way you climb on your horse in the first four seconds of the day and know that you suck at this, right? <laughs> like, so don't try and hide it and like not ask the guy questions to try and pretend like. Yeah you're better than you are at it. Like everyone knows you suck. That's why you're here. Yeah. Like it's to learn. So yeah. like, right. Like go ask a guy questions. Like, mm-hmm. at, like if you don't, if you're unsure about something, you're about to get kicked in the head by a thousand pound animal. Like no one is going to care that you ask a question about it. Like, yeah. and admit openly that you don't know the answer. Like, and that's like something that needs to just be like really learned. Mm. It's like, you can't hide that you suck at this stuff. Like you're around the best people in the world at this. You're around the best cowboys and the best ranch managers in the world. They know you suck at it. Yeah, like they could just tell by saddling the horse. Yep, they could know? literally like I could watch the way a guy puts a saddle on a horse and tell you plus or minus a year how long he's been riding. It's just mm-hmm. like um 
So like that kind of stuff, it's like, it's not, a, it's not a secret. So like get your pride out of the way yeah. and ask like a question. And I, and then by the end, you'll actually be good at it yeah. instead of just like keeping your mouth shut and acting like a tough guy the whole time. Mm-hmm. And then at the end you still suck. Yeah. Um, so just like ask the question, like put the pride That's, away. And just when like, you're in a learning, uh, learning environment, you have to ask questions. Yeah. yeah. That's how you get better. Yes. And it's so hard. That's like my big critique of like high functioning vets after they get out. Mm. Not everyone, but I would say like largely that's a problem. Is it again? Cause they're like, you've been so good at your job and like partially in the military, you there's an expectation that if you're in charge or, or you're around, like you're a professional and you know what you're doing. And right. Like by the time you show up to your platoon, like you've been through all this training and all this stuff. And so there's like this almost like artificial expectation that like you need to be just good at everything. Mm-hmm. And, uh, like the reality of like getting out is like, you're going to be basically good at nothing. Yeah. And, True story. yeah. And so like, if you want to be good at stuff again, like you need to be willing to like ask questions and like admit that you suck at it, which yeah. is like, and then I think that admitting that you suck at it to people who are like really good. Like if you're working on a ranch, like when I started doing it, I would go up to like the best guy and be like, dude, I know nothing. I was like, this is my, literally my first time. Like I was at a big branding, really formal, like kind of like Super Bowl type event. And they thought I knew like more than I did. And so I was like, dude, I've never branded before. Like, this is like a serious deal. Like there's like horses flying around. Pe- there's like things attached to ropes. Like you get yeah. in a wreck like really fast. And I was like, dude, I have not ever done this before. And like, I don't know what gave you guys the impression that I'm like, like that I have, but like, I have not done this, this is not something that's done in like the Southeast where, which is where I started. Mm. And so I was like, I don't know how to do this. And like, I think me going up to like the main guy and being like, dude, like, I'm not trying to hide anything. Like I haven't done this. Like, can you please like run me through what, like what expectations are? Like if I would get one roped and drag it to the fire, I'd be like, am I in the right spot? Like, th- was that good? Should yeah. I have, should I have gone to the left of that guy instead of the right? And like, I think that like instantly, like, puts people's guard down and they're like, Oh, I want to help this guy. Like, yeah, yeah it's mentor, like mentor. Yeah. Board. yeah. Like I, like, it's like this guy doesn't, he, you know, he's actually genuinely interested in getting better. So I want to, I want to like t- take time out of my day to, to make sure like that happens. And mm-hmm. it's when, if like, I would imagine that if I had just been like, Oh, I'm just going to act like I've been branding since I'm six years old. Like, <laughs> yeah. like I would have gone messed it up. People would have known that I haven't been branding for that long. And then they would have been like, Oh, well that guy sucks. Yeah. Like yeah, we're yeah. said something. ice him out. Like, yeah. yeah. Like we all know he sucks. Um, but if you just go and like Greg Putnam, my buddy who runs a little about cattle company, the seal, like he'll say the same thing. Cause like he started that ranch. He had no real like formal training or experience. And he would like go around and be like, dude, I don't know what I'm doing. Like I'm going to find the best guy and I'm just going to tell him straight up. Like, I don't know what I'm doing and I need help. Yeah. And they'd be like, Oh yeah, absolutely. Dude. I'll tell you everything I, I know. But if you show up there, you like try tough guy people and yeah. like act like you're the King cowboy and you suck. Like people yeah. just hate you. Yeah. It doesn't go over. So yeah. Well. Yeah. That's uh that is a crazy, crazy world. But, um, you know, at least, at least you're doing something that brings these guys back to it. You yeah. know, which yeah. is fantastic. So where can you apply? Where can we find you at? Yeah. So, um, Instagram, just like at bear hug cattle company. Our website is bear hug cattle company. Org. Okay. The, the application goes live on October 1st mm-hmm. and then it's open for a month and then we close it, sort through all the applicants, schedule interviews, all that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, and so, uh, that, that's kind of the, the flow of that, but it lives, you know, it lives on our website, the application. And then, you know, we, we post about it on social media like crazy to make sure that everyone knows. And then sure. we have, you know, if, if anyone's ever contacted us about it before we blast them a big email and say, Hey, the application for this year is open. So okay. that's kind of, that's kind of how it goes. Yeah. Awesome. And people Brother. can donate on the website as yep. well. The website. Um, yeah, absolutely. Excellent. Fantastic. Well, uh, thanks so much for coming in and sharing your story. Very unique. <laughs> um, also, who would have thought a rancher would have been a ranger officer, huh? Yeah, I know. It's like, <laughs> it's absolutely crazy. It but, just uh, goes to show you that we all have various backgrounds and yeah. various experiences, but to translate that into something that is helping so many people is outstanding. So thank you for what you do. Yeah, I appreciate you guys having me on. It's been been super cool. So thanks. Yeah, of course. Thanks for yeah. being here. This has been the Medivac Podcast, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for watching. If you guys want to find us, head on over to our Instagram. It's the easiest way to reach us, at Medivac Podcast or medevacpodcast.com. 
we have a donate button there too, which will take you over to the Robert Irvine Foundation, one of our sponsors. Uh, so go donate there. Check out what they do because they do some awesome stuff. And we'll see you next time. Thanks. See you guys. Bye.